from an undisclosed location, from a secret hunting spot known only to him and the guy who told him about it, and possibly the guy who told the guy who told him. It's the show all about hunting in New Zealand and around the globe. This is The Hunting Show. Now, here's your host, Stephen Spargo. Welcome along to The Hunting Show. Now, one thing that we get a lot of is feedback, and not all of it is positive. We get a a large amount of feedback from organisations or people that think hunting is reckless or that it's cruel to animals. So what I started doing on your behalf was actually I avoid replying to a lot of these emails, first of all, because dignifying them with a response would only fuel their fire. So what I decided to do was actually look online and see how other countries get along. And in doing that, I found that New Zealand gets off relatively lightly. Over here, most people understand that hunting is about food and where we get it from, and we understand that if you're going to eat meat, it's much more honest to kill it yourself. And in fact, that's where I got to. Most New Zealanders think that if you're going to eat meat, hunting is absolutely okay. The blood on your hands is just understanding what's going on, and it's far more ethical than buying a plastic-wrapped piece of meat in the supermarket. Unfortunately, we still have people that think that hunting is cruel to animals. I'm not going to start down the debate on whether trophy hunting is completely ethical. I've done some trophy hunting myself. It's about whether or not, first of all, there are some hunters in this country that that do hunting unethically. They're cruel to animals. I don't believe there's many. I think they're the minority rather than the majority. But is it that... People just don't understand. They've never seen it. They don't understand it. And for some reason, they think that an animal killed in a, in a meat shed or in a killing shed is far less cruel. I mean, that's, that's the only way I can put it. And unfortunately, most of those people have never been to one. And I've seen the comparison. I've been into the meatworks and seen how these animals are, uh, you know, there's someone certainly taking part in their death. And, and, and also, I don't particularly think it's a, a nice way to go. I'd like to put it out there to you. Do you think that there are hunters out there that are unethical? I suspect there are, but I'd like to challenge you. Uh, Is the way you hunting completely ethical? We we can't always get that clean shot. We can't always guarantee we're going to get that nice, clean kill. So what do you do about that? Do you have a problem with it? Are you striving for that better kill? Now, I found some audio from the ABC in Australia. Um, ethical hunters hope to challenge public perceptions and it's with the Bush Telegraph now I contact the ABC in Australia and the Bush Telegraph or Telegraph and they said it's absolutely okay for me to rebroadcast that so rather than me rant on these guys have done a great job bear in mind though these are Australian opinions so I'd like you to have a listen to this interview tell me what you think and do you think this interview is relevant to New Zealand remember you can contact me info at thehuntingshow.co.nz or online facebook www.facebook.com forward slash the hunting show or find our website www.thehuntingshow.co.nz remembering that website is about to be updated at the moment it's just a holding page but all of our contact details are on there Here we go. This is the interview that aired on Tuesday the 24th of June from the ABC and the Bush Telegraph. Thank you very much for letting me re-air it. I'll have a little bit of a rant at the end, but I'd like your thoughts. Right now on RN, you're listening to Bush Telegraph. I'm Cameron Wilson, also around Asia and the Pacific on Radio Australia. Now, in many parts of the world, hunting is valued. It's seen as part of the cultural heritage, yet... Here in Australia, you could argue that's not really the case. Often, hunters are portrayed as rednecks, cruel, and sometimes even environmental vandals. In a moment, you'll be hearing from Michael Adams, a recent convert to hunting who's decided to take it upon himself to encourage something of a national discussion about the motivations and ethics of Australian hunters. But before we hear from Michael, to Flinders Island, right in the middle of Bass Strait. It's a cold and wet time of year there. It's also the ideal time of year to go pig shooting. One of the island's hunters is Tom Rhodes and our reporter Penny Terry ventured to Flinders Island to meet him. Tom? G'day, how are you going? What's going on today? Just feeding all those cattle. <laughs> Sounds like they can hear you coming, Tom. You're their favourite person at the I moment. Can, they can see me coming, they know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been on the island for, Tom? I was born and bred here. Now, I've been told if I want to talk about pigs, I need to come and see you. What's this story about a boat? In it Was it the early 1900s? Yeah, early 1900s, there's a boat wrecked on the east coast here, apparently, and these pigs got off it, and they've gone mad ever since. Gone wild and 
kicked on from there. Okay, so tell me about the wild pigs you'll find here on Flinders. Are they big? Some of them are really big, yeah. For a sport shooting, they're, you know, a big one sort of worth getting. Last year I shot one, it'd be the biggest pig I've ever shot all the years I've been shooting them, and he was, he'd was be 200 kilo plus. Gee, wow. So what's what's the annual? How, how many do you get annually? Uh, last year was the most I've shot, but I mean, I never used to shoot down this way before, but now I'm sort of you know, managing the place, you've got to get rid of them. They probably ran wild down here for a while, but we're pulling them back into gear now, slowly. So what's the tally from last year? I got 101 last year and I've shot 32 this year so far. What colour are they? Uh, most, mostly black, but uh, there's a few around with um, sort of white with black spots on them. And there's a few around sort of ginger with black spots on them. All different colours. Whereabouts on the island are there? Uh, mainly down the back here where I am, where we are now. There's um, most of them I've got and sort of all in the mountain on Mount Stress Lake. So there's a fair few in there. What sort of damage do they do having wild pigs about on the island? Uh, if you saw when they really get into it, just looks like you dissed a paddock up. Yeah, and that's just, they just turn over everything. They're only chasing sort of thistle roots and sort of stuff in the ground, grubs and stuff. But they just, you know, you get sort of three or four of them and they make a mess in a night. You see some of the ones here, they're as fat as mud. <laughs> and it's really hard to, you know, think that they, they can get as fat as what they are. And so tell me, when do you go shooting? Oh, well, this time, during the winters, that you know, you'll find more out in the farms than you will. Summertime, you find a, a few. But um, oh, any night's usually good for them if they're out. But um, they don't mind cold, wet nights. What, what do you do when you're pig hunting? What do you need to take with you? Because I know that in some places they have pig dogs. No, no, well, they, they have it here. Blokes have had them here too. But, um, well, we just take a spotlight and a rifle and drive around the ute. You find them, you find them. If you don't, you go home. <laughs> What are they like as a, you know, a sport hunting yeah, good. animal? Yeah, good. Some of them are pretty st- stupid, but, you know, others, they see you coming, they get a bit light shy every now and then. They take a bit more catching up with, but we get them eventually. Is it pest eradication? Is it for sport hunting? Is it for eating? Oh, you can eat them. Yeah, it's a bit everything, really. I mean, we eat the, you know, the nice young one. They're worth sort of getting out of. We, when I was a kid... We used to catch the little ones and, and fatten them up, like grow them out and fatten them up, but they tend to go to fat, a lot fatter than sort of domestic pigs, but um, they're still good. What do they taste like? Oh, much like domestic pork, only probably a little bit gamier. Is it a bit darker colour, the flesh? No, nah, beautiful, same colour. <laughs> What's your recipe, Tom? We used to sort of just have them as normal pork when we used to rear them, but the wild ones we just sort of, unless you've got some hot water, you can't really scold them, so... We just sort of take the back legs, the line quarter off them, and you can sort of roast them and do whatever. Put a few spices and stuff with them. Yeah, they're all good. Flinders Island hunter Tom Rhodes speaking there with Penny Terry. Well, last time we covered hunting on Bush Telegraph, you a lot of you wrote to us, and uh, it was fairly clear that it's a, an emotive and at times a divisive topic to be discussing. Here's a couple of examples of some of the feedback we got. Denise wrote to us, Most hunters admit... They mainly hunt for entertainment and justify their bloodthirsty thrill-seeking by claiming they are helping the environment. Denise goes on to say they do not consider how the killing, lust and lack of compassion for the animals that suffer affects the ethical attitudes of society. Uh, Lorraine said shooting and maiming animals for pleasure is barbaric and a disgrace to our nation. One has to ask what sort of person enjoys inflicting pain and suffering on an innocent animal. Now, they're not necessarily indicative of all the views that are sent through, but they do highlight what I mentioned earlier, that this is both emotive and at times polarising. Michael Adams, Associate Professor Michael Adams, is both a hunter and uh, an academic at the University of Wollongong. And Michael believes there's a lot a rational discussion could provide, could offer, that would contribute to our understanding of our relationship with the environment, but he believes ethical hunters are not necessarily taking part in that public discussion right at the moment. Michael, thank you for joining us on Bush Telegraph. Nice to have you along. No, thank you. We'll, go to, we'll get to some of the big questions soon, but your involvement in hunting, what is it? It's, it's been pretty low-key so far. Like I'd, I'd regard myself as a beginner very much. Um, I had some hunting traditions in my family, my grandparents and my parents in other countries, but I started once I bought rural land in the Snowy Mountains, me, me personally hunting, but prior to that I'd been, been hunting with Aboriginal people in different places all over Australia, and I've got a bunch of Swedish relatives who were very keen hunters. So why did you start? 
I started because I guess I was learning from Aboriginal people about the a different way to engage in the environment. And, you know, I realised, like it's pretty obvious from the, the comments you just read out, hunting is generally regarded negatively in Australia. But when I met some of my Swedish relatives and, and spent time in Sweden, um, hunting is a very mainstream middle-class activity with a huge amount of community acceptance in Sweden, which is indicating, you know, there are some really clear cultural differences. When exactly did you start hunting? Uh, maybe three years ago. Okay, so quite new to, yeah, yeah, to, yep. to the, what do you call it, a pastime, a hobby? Uh, it's not any – well, for me, it's about getting food primarily. It's about a different way to get food. And it, what it teaches you, what it teaches me, is about being alert in the environment in a different way. You know, I'd spent tons of time bushwalking, rock climbing, all those kind of things. And hunting, for me, has been a very different way of being aware of my surroundings. What's the landscape like where you hunt? Uh, it's it's a old grazing property, but it hasn't been grazed in 20 or 30 years, so it's mixed open country and eucalypt woodland. And do you shoot predominantly? Yeah, yeah. I have a 22, and our primary um, hunting target is rabbits. Was that when you recommenced hunting or you started at a more regular in a more regular context recently? Was it rabbit, a rabbit that you first killed? Yeah, yep. How difficult was that to do the, the, the first time, three years ago? The... For, my son hunts with me, he's 17, and we we both decided we were going to make sure that we could hit what we aimed at, so we spent a lot of time at the range, uh, you know, get, making sure our target targeting was good, and then went out for rabbits, and, you know, there's a there's a bunch of things to learn about that, but the, the interesting thing is, you know, when you kill a cute furry animal like a rabbit, and then, you know, come up to the animal and then transform it from being an animal into being food... That can be, you know, a reasonably confronting process if you haven't done that before. What do you see as your obligations as a hunter? Uh, I think it's, you know, very much the standard things that you see on hunters' websites or places like the Sporting Shooters Association, the a completely ethical approach, meaning that you prioritise safety all the time, you uh, aim for clean kills, so instant kills, and you you... Uh, uh, you're supportive of the whole idea of ethical hunting to the extent of reporting people who are not ethical hunters, you know, people who are doing things illegally, if you like, and, you know, bracing them up if you see that. Do you see much of that? Uh, I don't, personally, but the, you know, since I started researching and talking to hunters and plugging into the websites, getting, you know, getting immersed in the field, I think that there is, you know, there is certainly a proportion of that happening out there, which is what feeds into the predominantly negative uh, view of hunting, mm, that's, I think. That uh, was my next question, is do you believe that the, the derogatory view out there is based in any any substance, any fact? Yeah, I think it's interesting, like, you know, one of the, the people you just played there said something like, most hunters say... Well, we don't actually know what most hunters say. There's almost no research in Australia. Little bits coming out at the moment, but that, that was the other reason I was interested in getting involved. There's large amounts of research in the US and in Europe and New Zealand, but almost nothing in Australia about either the motivations and ethics of hunters or their practical kind of impact in the environment. Don't we get to, to understand those motivations through the, the political involvement of, of hunters? I think we get to understand the motivations of a very small number. The, so the sporters and uh, uh, sorry the shooters and fishers party is supported by some hunters and not by all I would argue. So what's the nature of the research that's been done overseas that that we could perhaps replicate here in Australia? Uh, lots of lots of statistical stuff. So for instance in Sweden um, the the number of hunters is only about three percent, which is not that different to Australia. In Australia it might be two percent, but something like eighty seven percent of the Swedish population support hunting. And the reason they – or the primary um, factors which indicate whether they support or not is whether they know a hunter. And uh, a large number of Swedes know a hunter, even though there's only 3% of Swedes who hunt. And we, we have no figures on that in Australia and no figures on why people would or would not um, support hunters. And in the US, there's uh, tons of research on the econo economic impact. We just started that here with, uh, I think, on your program. You looked at a recent Victorian study which attempted to put uh, an e economic value on hunting. Yes, yeah, which kicked off a, <laughs> an extended debate about the merits or otherwise. Mm, or, mm. 
of hunting. So your what you've mentioned there comes back to your earlier point about the the cultural value placed on on hunting and how that influences how people feel about it. I would imagine here in Australia, if you asked somebody, do they support the right of Indigenous people to hunt and gather? you would get strong support for that. But if you ask the question, do you support the idea of a white Australian going out shooting deer or pigs on the weekend, you may get far less support. Yeah, which is really interesting. And partly it's because I think people, again, as your earlier comment suggested, people think there's there's some kind of thrill, there's some kind of bloodlust or some other thing like that um, involved in non-Indigenous people hunting. And there's also a bit of an assumption that it's not subsistence, like you don't need to do it. You can go down to the supermarket and buy your food, which you know feeds into a whole other discussion about is it more ethical to buy food in a supermarket or to actually procure your own by whatever means. But it is, it's almost impossible to have a discussion about hunting without going down the, the paths of welfare and whether it's all about the, the thrill and the, mm. the ethics of what's happened, also about feral animal control and how effective mm. it is as the measure there. It does feed into to many complex issues. Yeah, and I guess, you know, I'm interested, you know, we were discussing earlier the, when I when it came out in The Guardian, there were 140 comments, very many of which were highly critical. But I'm interested in having the conversation, in putting the, putting the, the discussion and the research out there. And in that, you know, one of, the, one of the routine responses you get is from people who are vegetarians or vegans. And they, I actually think that people who are vegetarians, there's more... Um, potential for commonality than conflict in discussing hunting. They're people who make ethical choices about their food, which is what I do too. I want to, um, you know, be responsible for what I eat. And those ethical choices can be around healthy eating. And many people would argue that uh, wild, wild meat, kangaroo or rabbit or whatever, is a whole lot healthier than farmed meat. And they also argue that it's better for the environment. And I could make that argument too. So we're making a series of ethical choices but coming up with quite different outcomes. But I think that that's the basis for a conversation. Mm. And I'm you know, interested in opening that up. There is opposition to hunting all along the spectrum though, isn't there? It's not just at the, say, the, the vegan end of the debate, you can hear the RSPCA quite articulating, articulately arguing against hunting. Yeah, and I think part of that is about hunters lifting their game. I mean, there's no question that not everyone makes clean kills all the time. Uh, but you could similarly say not ev- that doesn't always happen in an abattoir, but, but that's not a reason for not doing it better. And I think that, you know, in Australia, when you get a firearms licence, you are not required to demonstrate your competence with the gun, and I think that's a mistake. I think we should be required to demonstrate our competence with a gun, just like we're required to demonstrate our competence with a car before we get a driver's licence. And that would start to address some of those issues about cruelty. I mean, if an animal is killed instantly, there isn't any cruelty involved as far as I'm concerned. You're listening to Bush Telegraph on on RN. My guest is Michael Adams, who is a hunter, also Associate Professor of Human Geography at the University of Wollongong and the author of an article recently that uh, appeared amongst other places in The Guardian Online. It was called Caught in the Net of Life and Time, What Modern Hunting Means to Me. Some of what you described in that article was quite explicit, Michael. Um, Why did you choose to go into so much detail? Because... When I was doing it, I was thinking a lot about it. It was quite confronting. The um, You know, I, I don't, and I think this applies to a lot of hunters, I don't hunt thoughtlessly. You think about the animal, you think about the processes that the animal's going through once it becomes aware of you, if it does, and, you know, what happens when it's killed and what might happen to the out, the rest of the community of animals there. So, and, and then the process of turning it, as I said, from an animal into food, the... So I wanted to I wanted to put those thoughts out there um, very explicitly to see partly what the response from from a spectrum of other people was and partly just to try and clarify my own thinking about these things. But if I can just I'll just read a touch from the the article if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, you don't mind me reading your words. Uh, I kneel beside it in the dust and my instinct is to just be with it quietly while it dies. But as it convulses and struggles. The voices of my education are telling me to put it out of my misery. You then go on to explain how you took your daughter's knife and quickly cut the young kangaroo's throat to the vertebrae, nicking my finger in the process. It goes on from there. Uh, Michael, I wonder why going into that kind of detail aids a rational discussion rather than an emotional discussion. I guess because, 
You know, I think we need to face up to it. You know, you can go and buy a piece of kangaroo meat in the supermarket or a piece of lamb in the supermarket and the the backstory of that is not that dissimilar to what I described there. At some point, somebody is up close to a living animal and then participates in its death. We just don't see any of that in the supermarket. It's all, you know, behind, a long way away from us. And I want to bring bring those things to the fore to think about what our moral relationship is in this situation. You know, if that had been, for instance, a a roadkill situation, if I'd hit a kangaroo with my car and then gone back to make sure it wasn't injured and and say I found it injured and I then decided to kill it, I don't think there would be a negative response to that. People would see that as being a positive thing. But because you know, I've chosen to kill the kangaroo or whatever the animal is in the first place. That's what provokes the the emotion and the reaction. But it's your conscious decision that also offends people, surely. Mm, it is, it is. And it, But, you know, I think there are good reasons for my conscious decision. If you're going to eat meat, I think it's it's a lot more honest to kill it yourself, to face up to that thing, to be involved in the... The, the blood on your hands than to just buy it plastic wrapped in the supermarket and not think about it. So what do you really think is the benefit, the public benefit, to be having a more open and frank discussion about hunting and its position in Australian society? I think we need, we need more research, which is what academics always say, I'm afraid, <laughs> but we need to understand hunters better. And I think that there's a wide spectrum and that in part of the story is that hunters need to lift their game in Australia and... But, but if we start putting information out there about what hunters do and what it means to them and the, you know, the effects on the environment or whatever else, we can start to have an informed discussion rather than a purely emotive discussion. How far away from that discussion taking place do you feel we are? I suspect we're a long way away. But, and I'm partly interested in uh, international comparative research around that because you know, why can you have that discussion in Sweden but not here? Mm-hmm. In Sweden, they shoot 100,000 moose every year which is, you know, that's an awful lot of animals, has no impact on the moose population at all because they're very carefully managed. And most Swedes eat wild meat. So that, you know, you can have that conversation in Sweden. It's not uncontroversial. You know, there's differing views, but you can still have the conversation. Whereas in Australia, I think, you know, we mostly wind up shouting at each other. And, and both sides are culpable in that. I think, you know, very often hunters are highly defensive and the other side of the, you know, the anti-hunters or the people who might be in the middle um, don't take enough time to think about it before they respond. Is this, in some ways, is this issue, the debate that's had around the, the issue of um, whether we should be hunting or not, and if we do, how we do it, is it a classic case of a city-country divide? I think that's certainly part of the story. Like if you, you know, if you live in rural areas, a firearm is just another implement, like your tractor. You know, it's a thing that you, you use when it's appropriate in a, a whole spectrum of different ways. Whereas for urban people, that's not the case at all. But, but the other side of that is that there's a large number of urban hunters in Australia. And again, we don't fully know the statistics on that. And that would be useful to know. So part of the, um, part of the sort of pro-hunting argument is that those urban hunters spent a lot of money in rural Australia. That Victorian report was talking about that. Mm. Um, but, but it also means, I think, that you know, you, the firearm is kind of out of context in an urban area. It's then associated with a whole bunch of other stuff, which is almost uniformly negative. There's also, I, I have seen some um, reporting on the, the, the profiling, if you like, of, of what we do know about hunters and the level of education and the level of income. Um, what I've seen goes against what you'd call a typical redneck, which is often the label um, put on on hunters, that often you'll have hunters that are highly educated, that do have reasonable disposable income. Yeah, no, that's very true. And it's quite interesting, again, if you look at the Swedish example, hunting is positive, co- positively correlated with higher education, so more hunters have higher education. If you look at the US, it's the opposite. Hunters are typically people with less education, and Australia is somewhere in the middle of those. But I certainly, like within my university, I know numerous people who are hunters, but who don't make it at all public that they are hunters. Which comes to one of your points that the, the so-called ethical hunter, as, mm. you, as you describe him or her, is silenced in this public debate. I think that's right, and I think people need to actually step up to that a bit. But, you know, what happens is, what happened to me is, you know, a large amount of, you know, targeted criticism, um, you know, about your involvement. But that's, I just decided that, you know, that was going to be part of the package, that that's what I had to do to start the discussion.
Associate Professor Michael Adams, who's from the University of Wollongong and also recently took up hunting about three years back. Well, there is an interesting and reasonably informed discussion going on on our Facebook page at the moment, facebook.com slash Bush Telegraph. Uh, Rowan Reid's executive producer of Bush Telegraph. What are you, what's happening online, uh, Rowan? Uh, already we've got uh, – th- it's only been up there for uh, a little over an hour and we've got more than uh, 35 posts, 35 comments. And there's a lot of people are talking about uh, that, that they do think that people um, misdun- misunderstand hunters. Um, Gary Millard says, I guess it's natural for people who do not understand hunting to make judgments based on flawed information. Who can blame them? The Greens promulgate it for that very purpose. Okay, Mark Carter's made an interesting comment. Mark says, I'm personally strongly in favour of sustainable controlled hunting, but spend some time around the Australian hunting community and you'll quickly see how they've earned this irresponsible redneck label. Of course, there are some in the hunting community who break the mould and do the right thing, but they are outnumbered by the others. I find it hilarious that when this topic is mentioned online, a legion of people claiming to be shining examples of best practice turn up and set about bashing critics. If they spent that energy reining in the cowboys in their community, they wouldn't have so much to moan about. There were quite a few comments back to Mark to justify that comment. Um, Another interesting angle I thought that came through in the comments were people were sort of okay with the idea of hunting if the animal is used for meat, but if it was just used for for hunting's sake, they weren't so keen on it. Um, This idea of trophy hunting doesn't seem to be getting the same amount of support. Mm. Yeah, Anna Clements wrote, uh, "Hunting is good. Is uh, hunting for food is one thing. Trophy hunting is quite another." Where and uh, where was this other one? Um, Another Anna wrote in and said, uh, "Anne Stewart, I don't agree with hunting for sport." Anywhere, do they eat their kill? Mm, Okay, which we're hearing from quite a few people who do. If you want to join in that discussion, facebook.com slash bushtelegraph. We'll keep an eye on it. And as you heard in that that interview with Michael, we do definitely feed in the the comments and the views into the the interviews down the track. Thanks, Rowan. We'll keep an eye on that throughout the day. Rowan Reid, who's the executive producer of Bush Telegraph. I should point out there's a picture of Vladimir Putin on that post as well, and we're being questioned as to why that's the case. uh, He's there because we presume given that that picture was released as part of his campaign, that it represents the fact there is support for hunting within the Russian community. So in line with what Michael Adams was arguing in that interview, there are parts of the world where hunting is viewed quite favourably amongst the public. That interview was conducted by Cameron Wilson from the ABC and that aired on the Bush Telegraph. And thank you very much to the guys at the Bush Telegraph for letting me air that show or that interview. If you'd like to win one of those great Gerber knives, you actually get a couple of them if you are active with us. Very simple. All you need to do is send us feedback, not only about the show you've just listened to and whether you think something like that or that is the same attitudes that Kiwis have towards hunting or some Kiwis have towards hunting, or find us on iHeartRadio. We're relatively new to that platform, but we are finding it is getting lots and lots of downloads because we are the only hunting show on iHeartRadio currently that's internationally. Well, that's the only one I can find. Um, so please have a look on there, thumbs up us, leave a comment. We do know the bulk of you actually listen through iTunes, which is fantastic. Uh, it means that you automatically subscribe and get the show each week. But please find us on those other platforms, mention us in the forums, help our Facebook page grow. We are keeping an eye on it. We've got some quite sexy software that actually scans the net for any mention of the show or anywhere that you're doing things. So we are aware of the good and the bad feedback that we're getting from time to time. So Remember, find us online, www.thehuntingshow.co.nz. That website is due to change. We're not quite sure when. Uh, We're just waiting for the final approval, but we are going to be part of a larger website that will all be announced in due course. And we do like it. We do love the fact that we're up to near 8,000 downloads now. That must put us amongst New Zealand's number one podcasts. I don't have some of their numbers, mainly because some of them are very shy about how many downloads they're getting. But that's because of you. You really are supporting the show. And I think hunters in general are information seekers. So they're going out, they're finding information, they're looking for stuff because they've had to in the past. And with the onslaught of some of these great things, one, like us, but two, like the the great shows that you're seeing on Sky TV and some of the other channels, hunting is becoming more and more mainstream. 
there is some concerns around that. I've seen them in the forums. People are saying if we advertise and get too many people into our sport, it's going to ruin it for the rest of us. And is it going to cause a whole lot of inexperienced hunters to get out there and again, this could give us a bad name. This could give our sport that horrible stuff that you're seeing out of the Australian, out of that Australian interview. Bad practices, you know, not clean kills, animals walking around wounded and hunters in general getting a bad name. But I suspect Kiwis are smarter than that. Well, I hope Kiwis are smarter than that. Uh, let me know what you think. Remember guys, good hunting and be safe. Podcasting from an undisclosed location, from a secret hunting spot known only to him and the guy who told him about it, and possibly the guy who told the guy who told him. It's a show all about hunting in New Zealand and around the globe. This is The Hunting Show. Find The Hunting Show on Facebook and Twitter for up-to-date information on...